was a friend or who was um, someone who then told the story of his stepfather who was taken away in the night. Can you talk a little bit about that scene? Did that kind of come out of the blue? Did that just kind of come up? Because that's, that's a really yeah, the question was about Suryono Anwar's neighbor who tells his story in the TV studio. That totally came out of the blue. Suryono was introduced to me as a paramilitary leader and a good actor. Uh, he had been in a paramilitary theater troupe with Hermann in that theater troupe before I met them. Hermann had played in drag in that theater troupe. That's the origin of Hermann dressing up in drag, too. When I, in fact, and it came out so much out of the blue that it happened while I wasn't filming. I was filming with Adi in another part of the TV studio, and my Colombian cinematographer, who doesn't speak Indonesian, was filming the lunch break, just covering it, but not understanding what was being said. And I think he was following the intensity of the emotions, which is why the scene works. He's very intense, but he didn't know what was happening. I only heard the story six months after the shoot, and I was horrified to hear the story. A very important principle for me in making this film was that there should be no survivors, vic victims, bystanders in any of the reenactments. Everybody in the reenactment should be perpetrators, paramilitary leaders, or their immediate families. The village massacre scene is, of course, a set, and everybody in it, the women, the children, the old people, are the perpetrators' immediate families. It's the wives, children, and, grand uh, and parents of the perpetrators and paramilitary leaders. This was an error. It's an error of omission, not of commission, but it's an error. And when I put the film together, I noticed he keeps popping up afterwards. He's in the village massacre scene. He's even on the talk show cheering along uh, with the rest of the, the people in the audience. And I was so upset by it and so perplexed by it, I actually phoned his house. It's, by the time I had a rough cut, it was about two and a half years after the shoot, because there were 1,200 hours of footage, we did a lot of shooting after that, and I thought, how could, what was he doing there? I felt very embarrassed by it, I felt tainted by it, I felt terribly guilty towards him. His wife answered the phone when I called and told me that he'd passed away six months earlier from complications of diabetes. I asked her if he ever, her husband had ever spoken about why he was in the film. She said he spoke a lot about it. He was waiting for it to come out, he wanted, and he was in the film because he wanted to share with the world this awful thing that had happened to him. I guess I felt a certain amount of relief where I thought, well, he was wanted to be there, he knew what he was doing, he was right, he read me the right way, and he's made the film that much more powerful. He was on a mission, and if I pulled him out of the film, I would have he would have failed in his mission. I definitely, if I'd heard it, I would have taken him aside and said, spend the rest of the day behind the camera with me, and tomorrow, don't come back. Um, but on the other hand, if I could, and if I, and if I could do it all over again, even knowing why he wanted to be there, I still would have pulled him out if I knew the story. He, he should not be there. And I think that, his presence is just one powerful example of how the process overtook everyone involved with making it like a tsunami. 